Welcome, everybody. This is our last panel of the day in this room. I just wanted to welcome you all to teaching analytics, as we've been calling it. It's from the classroom to the locker room, teaching the next generation of sports analysts. We have an esteemed panel here today. With us, we have Jeremy Abramson from the University of Southern California. <laughs> We've got Jeffrey Ullman from the University of Iowa. We have Niels Rudy from INSEAD, Ed Kaplan from Yale, and the session will be moderated by Mike Magazine from the University of Cincinnati. I am Matt Kalmus. I'm one of the co-leads here at the conference. Thank you for coming out today. And at the end of the panel, we'll do Q&A. In here, we'll do it with the microphone. So we'll look out for questions, raise your hand. One of us will come around and get you a mic. So start thinking now. That way, we have some good ones for the end. With that, I'll turn it to Mike. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Kimberly, who's not here, uh, who helped put this together, and the organizers. For the last couple of years, I've been trying to get a teaching session on here. And uh, it's something that uh, I believed in for a long time. And, and it looks like there's a few people here. I'm just curious who's here. H how many people here are students currently? OK. How many are faculty? Current or Well, <laughs> well for whatever reason you're here. Uh, OK. Um, well, that makes all the difference now. <laughs> uh, how, how many? are professional uh, sports analytics folks. OK. Um, athletes? Others? Oh, gosh. Now I'm really curious. <laughs> All right. We'll see what that is. Um, you know, I, I, I think today analytics is, is, is not something that uh, is a gimmick. I think it's something we need, and if it's something we need, it seems like something we should be teaching. Uh, for the last few years, I've taught a course on uh, sports analytics. Uh, I also teach a class on bracketology, um, which obviously this is the time to teach the class on bracketology. We can talk a little bit more about that. So I, I'm. You know, we're going we're gonna to go around the panelists and ask them about what it is that motivated them to do this and, and, and why they think it's important to teach a course on, on this topic. And maybe we'll start with Jeremy at the end and work, work towards me. So um, the number one thing is I just am very passionate about sports. And uh, no one else at USC was doing anything kind of like this. And uh, it seemed like a good opportunity to, uh, my class is an undergraduate class, it seemed like a good opportunity to teach uh, undergraduate students and sort of get, get them early uh, to think about the numerical and quantitative aspects of sports. In my case, uh, I was actually asked by my boss effectively to teach a, a class um, as part of a larger university initiative um, to engage our first year students. So I teach a one credit hour class in sports analytics, and so assuming basically no prerequisites. And uh, what I get them to do is just using sports examples, trying to teach them some fundamental critical thinking using quantitative uh, skills. And uh, my ultimate goal is not necessarily turning them into sports analysts, but to potentially turn them on to uh, disciplines where they would be using those skills. Um, I would say it's, it's two reasons. One is that there's a lot of demand from students to take a sports analytics course and to position themselves for a potential sport career. The other thing is that I think sports is an excellent uh, field to teach modeling and analytics. So it's a very good setting to also get across the general principles. Right. Yeah, yeah uh, my experience is actually similar to Nils. Um, I'm an operations researcher. We have a lot of modeling for decision making courses in the management school, uh, but not all students are interested in the subject areas where they come up. Not everyone wants to, to be a financial analyst. Not everyone wants to do supply chains. Not everyone wants to do marketing. Not everyone wants to study policy applications. So the question really was, uh, how could we get more people interested in modeling? That was actually the first motivation. And sports was just sort of the perfect hook for this. 
but uh, as, as I got into this, I've been doing this for three years now, so it of course has about 50 something, mainly MBA students and some other students from across the university, uh, it became very clear that not only was there a lot you could learn about sports itself from, from, from applying these methods, but sports offers an excellent opportunity for studying issues which are greatly important in all walks of business, and, and you just have this nice laboratory ability to do it in sports. So there's this sort of two-way back and forth between the tools, uh, the sports, and then a larger appreciation of management issues. Um, it, it, in spite of the fact that the University of Connecticut just beat the University of Cincinnati in basketball. Oh, Ten dollars. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go right back to Ed, who's uh, at Yale, so he's you know, it's his school, you might say. Uh, and I'm just curious what you, what you really hope to achieve, the student takeaways, what you hope you, you might achieve for folks who might be, who might not be in sports analytics. Because well, not every one of those students certainly is going to go into that field. Sure. So, I mean, th there are a small number of students who have, who have actually gone off and gotten jobs with sports, uh, sports organizations, sports leagues. Um, it's important to remember that what one can do in this area is heavily dependent upon what your technical training is. So I'm constrained by the audience that I have. These are people who are second year MBA students, which means they've had the equivalent basically of a semester's worth of statistics and maybe some earlier modeling. So uh, techniques that you were seeing in the, for those of you who went to some of the research track presentations, uh, great work. A lot of it is just not something you can do with someone who's only, only had, had uh, that level of training. What I try to do is, is focus on the questions, ways that the models can be used to teach them something about the game that they wouldn't have understood otherwise, uh, and also, as I said, to try to learn lessons about more general issues. Let me just give one example. Uh, uh, modern sports analytics over the past several years has paid an awful lot of attention to figuring out what the individual contribution is of a player to the success of a team. And baseball started, of course, with you know, win probability added and, 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 and war and things like this, and all the way up to what, what we saw in one of the basketball talks today about expected points added. Um, you know, in management, there are so many activities which are group activities, which are fundamentally collective activities, and at the end of the year, managers have to make evaluations about individual performance. How much of a bonus does this person get? How much of a bonus does that person get? And how are those decisions made these days? They're not really made on the basis of uh, a quantitative systematic uh, approach, and actually the sports IDM gives you a nice laboratory for thinking of it. In baseball, you have this nice, you know, a nice state space, you have bases and outs, and you can kind of figure out run values and win values added. Let's go to a completely different arena, education. The players in the game might be the teachers. The equivalent of the win probability is your student graduates high school. What's the incremental value added by all the different teachers who are collectively playing this game? It's a complicated problem, but thinking of it in these terms might give us a very new way to actually assess some of these uh, activities that, that just hasn't come about to now. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in making those connections. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it sounds like you have a, uh, a group of students that are actually here in the room, Jeremy, and so maybe you can tell them what you think the takeaways are, and f for both the students in the class and also for non-sports analytics folks in general. Um, well, well, the first thing I want them to learn is that this stuff is real. You know, this isn't just uh, this isn't just stat geek sort of uh, you know contemplating their navel, that there's, that there's real applications to this, there's real, uh, and it makes a, a difference both on field and, uh, and um, to, the bottom, to the organization's bottom line. Uh, the second thing I want them to learn is that there's a number of different directions that uh, a numerical or a, a technical background can get you in a, in a career in sports if you're interested in, in sports. Almost everybody in my class is specifically interested in sports. Now, most of them will end up with sports careers, that's sort of the nature of the beast, um, but there's a lot of different directions you can go with, with a technical background um, in the field of sports, whether it's dealing with you know, you know, the, the on-court stuff or uh, business operations. It's just you know, to sort of give them an exposure to uh, what a technical background can, can do for people in, in the sports industry. Mm -hmm. Jeff, tell us a little about the, um, you have a one credit course you said in a business school. What, what do you really hope that the students can take away from that? So we start off really basic. Um, 
I just you know really try to pull some things that they are familiar with to, to leverage those to get them understanding more, I guess uh, technically. Um, so you know start off with an example of Bill Belichick going forward on fourth down and show uh, with you know with no mathematical preparation you can logically think through that and then you can talk about well why can't why are other situations in the game of football more difficult. So understanding what's an easy problem and what's a hard problem is one, one skill to be able to have. Um, I also do uh, things like uh, when you're watching a baseball game, uh, when a broadcaster says something, how can you uh, distill kind of the BS versus what actually may actually be you know, accurate? Um, you know, so we talk about like- Is there anything that's actually accurate? <laughs> score. I, uh, <laughs> score, fair enough, fair enough. There, there are definitely uh, <laughs> s more s chronic offenders. Um, but uh, so just s simple things like conditional probability, you, know, you can view a batting average uh, as a conditional probability if you see it versus a particular pitcher. And we can talk about, well, does that really even mean something if you've only faced that pitcher a handful of times? And, um, so very bas basic statistical concepts and is where we start off with. And then we get, I get more aggressive. Um, I, I feel with, through the, the vehicle of sports, I could actually have them solve or you know, think about hard problems where they might uh, balk a little bit more. Uh, you know, if that, if there's a brick wall and there's sports on the other side, a certain type of student will run into that brick wall a lot more readily. Right. You know, it's interesting. He brought up the Belichick uh, situation and, and I, I'm sure in this audience we just have to mention the Belichick decision and everybody knows what I'm talking about. Some of the students are freshmen that I have, and so they're not quite clear on it. But you can do the analytics and show what the, uh, whether it was the right decision or not. And it certainly was the right decision, and yet he was blasted in the, in, in the media. He was blasted in the media because they didn't make the fourth down. They lost the game. And yet, so one of the, the real takeaway there for the students, part of it is doing some of the math. But really, the takeaway is you can make the right decision, but it doesn't always come out the right way. That the outcomes may, may not uh, uh, show that the decision is, is very different from the decision. So to try to distinguish that and have the students understand that, that's one of the takeaways that, that I like to have with the students. Now, Niels, I, I, I know you, you're in a situation where you're in a university which is in France, while you teach in Singapore, which is a little different situation than the rest of us, and uh, also, but, but maybe there's some commonalities with the kinds of things we've been talking about. So maybe you can talk about what, what you see as student takeaways and, and other kinds of activities associated yeah. with this. Uh, yeah, so to start with, we have MBA students from 86 nationalities. So if you start talking about Fort Down or something, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's <laughs> going to be a challenge. Um, right. His football is different. <laughs> yeah, so he's not played with the hands. Um, <laughs> and uh, so for me, it's, it's got two things that is, is really try to get across. One is the kind of the process of analytics in sport. How important it is to write, uh, ask the right question, then come up with a model and a plan for how you're going to analyze it, collect the data, and then how do you kind of get this conclusions across to the various decisions makers and stakeholders. So I think that process, and that's also follow up, up on, on earlier things by Ed, I think it's really important. The other thing is, kind of, as you were hinting a bit on, is just how important it is to not base your conclusions on outcomes. So I think it's very kind of central in sport analytics that an outcome consists on kind of skill-based performance and luck. And so many people try, seem to try to explain the causalities of luck. So just how to separate out those two and have a framework for that and how to, to think about the, what, how to disentangle that. I think that's just a really So, so those are really the away. same kinds of things that, that we deal with. The fact that you have students from other nationalities mm -hmm. and you teach in other countries really doesn't matter. Uh, our student body is very international. The students uh, get to do projects in the class. So one of the exciting things for me uh, is to watch how concepts that have been developed in the study of certain kinds of games, the students can kind of take them and run with them 
uh, in applications to sports that they know more about and where I don't really understand the details. So for example, one of the things that we emphasize in the class is this notion of state space models for the purpose of computing win probabilities. We do this in basketball, we do it in baseball, we do it in football, we do it in hockey. And then when it comes time for the student projects, uh, one of my favorite projects this year was a, was a, a group of students who put together a, a player evaluation model based on win probability for the game of cricket, uh, something that I don't know a whole lot about. Uh, these people uh, got data from the Indian Professional Cricket League. Uh, I, I won't go through all the details, but I just want to mention one interesting idea, outcome. Of this. No, no, let me, let me just mention one uh, <laughs> outcome because it, really, it was really quite neat. Um, they, they looked at the salaries these players received. They had their measure of basically what was the equivalent of run value added, something like that. So they have a measure of productivity for each of these players. Now, and it turns out that there were ethnic Indians and there were people who were not from India who were very accomplished cricketers who were playing in the Indian Professional League. If you were simply to look just across the range of salaries that these people were played, if you were to look at the distribution of the value added, you wouldn't really notice anything. But when they actually computed the ratios for how much were people being paid per run created or for, for the equivalent in, in cricket, they discovered something interesting. All of the Indian nationals were highly overvalued and all of the foreign players were highly undervalued. And why was that? And it wasn't anything that was an objective of the study. It wasn't something they went into uh, thinking they were going to do this. They just kind of, after they had created their measures, did this after the fact. They don't, scratching their heads. Isn't that interesting? So sometimes just having a new way of looking at the game leads to you know, discoveries or observations that you would, you would just not have even thought to look for before you started to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, I, the, the, the courses I do, I, I, I do a course, he's talking about an MBA class at Yale, and I do a class that has no prerequisites except for high school algebra and the ability to open Excel. And um, for students from, am, am I doing that? Uh, from students from all over the campus, um, and it's, um, that's a challenge. You know, I, I mean, one of the things I, I try to do, I, if I'm dealing with baseball, I talk about the fact that, you know, baseball, you can describe it by, by the number of outs, the number of people on base, and so forth, very easy. And you move from state to state, and it's a Markov chain. But, you know, you never have to talk about that. You never have to talk about that within this, within this format. It's not necessary to do that. It's very easy to just write zeros and ones and things like that. Um, so there are some challenges like that. And, and the other class I do on bracketology, obviously, is related to NCAA basketball. I do that with Paul, Paul Bazier from Prediction Machine. He promised to be here, but I can't see out there if he is. Um, and, and obviously, that class is, that class is, is mostly for MBA students, and, and that's quite different in, in what we do there. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious also, uh, uh, Jeremy, maybe you can talk a little about what your audience is, what, you, what, you, you know, what kinds of things you do in the class, what you expect of them, and, and so forth. So it was a, it was a big challenge uh, developing the course because I wasn't sure what the profile of the student would look like. Um, you know, I wasn't, I, so it turns out that the, the people, so I have a class that's actually very similar. There's no prerequisites. Um, it's an upper division class, but lower division students are welcome to take it. So most of my students are actually non-technical. Most of them are, uh, there's a number of communications majors, there's a number of journalism majors. Uh, it really it cuts a, an interesting cross-section across all, you know, all of the parts of the campus. We have, we have a few technical, a mechanical engineer, I think, um, we have a graduate student in journalism. So it, from, from freshmen to grad students, from, um, you know, from economics to literally just about every major you can imagine. I, mean, I have 50 students, so obviously not every major, but, but uh, it, it's a really wide cross-section. It's, it's difficult to, to sort of tailor a course to, to uh, something that everyone can understand you know, without making it too technical. Uh, what do your colleagues think about this? What does the administration think about this? What, did they want you to do this course? I, th I think Jeff said that he was encouraged to, to right. actually do this. Uh, w without getting into the grotesqueries of how uh, <laughs> higher education is run, um, and it's, yeah. um, <laughs> there's, there's issues with where it should live. Let's put it that way. 
Um, so when I, when I was research, researching uh, the curriculum for the course, I uh, spoke to a number of professors, uh, that were, including Mike, that were, um, that were teaching similar courses. And some of them were in the economics department, some of them were in, uh, in school management, some of them were in, you know, I'm actually the oddball here. I'm a computer scientist. I'm not a, um, an operations researcher. But some of them were, were in the computer science department. So there is an issue of where this should live, where this should go. And um, you know, that might be dictated by whatever particular content of the course is. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult to figure out what exactly you should teach for your cross-section of students. Right, right. I mean, I have a little bit of you know, uh, colleagues who won't allow our Master of Science students to get credit for my bracketology class. So. I, I understand some of that. You know, one of the things I do in the sports analytics class is look at player and team evaluation, trying to compare players and teams, and also on-field activities, you know, whether you should steal a base, whether you should go for fourth down, things like that. I'm wondering, Jeff, what, what kinds of things you focus on that, uh, in, in, in the one credit class you do. Mine's three credits, so you, 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 know, you can only do one third of what I do. <laughs> My students would probably tell you I do more than that. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I really, I, you know, the number one thing I always get from any class I teach is that I, uh, I give too much work. So it's consistent across my one credit hour class, but nobody complains because they're doing something that, you know, they're opting to be there and we're talking about sports, so. Which is amazing, because I don't think I give hardly any, and I think I still have students that complain. Yeah. So maybe that's <laughs> Well, they don't complain to me. So. Fair enough, <laughs> fair enough. So uh, I guess I'm very conscious about not making my class just sitting in and talking about what happened on Monday Night Football, but, you know, is there something that happened that we could talk, that I actually could, you know, on the fly talk about something quantitative? because. That's where my expertise is. Now, I can credibly talk about sports. I mean, I've, as anybody in this room could talk about sports. Uh, and I played at an organized, you know, low level. Uh, but, you know, to say I'm an athlete would be like, I guess, calling Stan Van Gundy a statistician because he picked up ESPN's <laughs> analytics <laughs> magazine. So, I mean, I don't claim to be an athlete. I don't know, have that, you know, domain expertise that you get from coaching and scouting. Um, but I do have the level of credibility uh, because I can talk about it casually. I can talk about them mathematically. I can also bring in students that I've had that come from the sports and work in the sports industry that have domain specific uh, expertise, which is, is nice. Um, and so that's what really I focus on uh, is trying to make it make it, make sure there's a pedagogical teaching point in everything I do. Um, I've even pulled something from you know now it's ancient news in the 1981 Major League Baseball strike. Um, using, she teaching Simpson's paradox using that. I think it's the Cincinnati Reds actually, that if you looked at the whole, there was a strike in that season that split the season in two pieces. If you look at the whole season, the Reds actually had the best record in the division, I but they were. it was the Expos that year. <laughs> but if you looked at the individual pieces, they didn't have the best, best record in any individual piece, so therefore they didn't qualify for the postseason that year. And so that is a common statistical uh, paradox. Um, and if you, you know, appears in other situations, but using an example from sports, so like I said, it, you know, dust off, remind kids there was baseball in 1981. Um, <laughs> and and it, it's, it, you know, to me, that's kind of the, the, the point. Um, you know, everything I try to, try to strive is like, what would I try, what's, what I want them to take away? And if they run across it later in their college careers, maybe they'll connect it, or maybe they won't remember it at all, but that's my goal. Okay, Ed, maybe you can talk a little about how this fits into it, into the Yale program, and and whether there's obstacles for you, and whether you were encouraged to do this, do you plan to uh, have additional courses and so forth? How does it all fit in? Well, uh, as I said, the original idea was to try to create another avenue by which people could be exposed to and hopefully turned on by modeling. So the initial. Uh, incarnation of this course was actually a half semester class, just six weeks, and uh, it designed in a fairly short period of time. And the initial enrollment was about, oh, I don't know, 24, 25 students. Uh, everybody who took the course was quite happy. Uh, it turned into a semester course, and as I said, uh, in the most recent offering, it's, it's doubled in size. We have 50-something students, most of them are MBAs. Uh, there are several very talented uh, Yale college undergrads who are allowed into the course providing they've had prerequisites, namely probability and statistics at the same level that, uh, that the MBAs have had. 
Uh, absolutely no resistance whatsoever in terms of teaching it as part of the MBA curriculum, quite the opposite. Everybody was really pretty excited about it. The students had a sports club, not as large as the Sloan Sports Club, obviously, uh, because we don't have a sports conference like this, but nonetheless, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm from the students. And in fact, there may in indeed be a second course. It wouldn't be a second course in analytics. It would probably be more something uh, in sports economics that uh, some of my colleagues in, in, in that, that group would offer. Right. So, so the, as, I understand, as I understand it, Niels, you haven't yet taught this course. No. So I'm, I'm trying to see what's your thought? What is this course going to look like? How does it fit into what INSEAD wants to do? Uh, talk a little about uh, the, the future for you in this course. So I, I think it's, it's two sides of that. Well, one is to get the capability to do the analytics. Another thing is to understand the demi demand side of analytics and different stakeholders. So fan-based analytics, analytics for media, storytelling, for performance analysis, and skill improvement. So. Okay, so, so, so when is this going to uh, happen? Uh, May, June. May, June, okay, great, great. One of the things that, that I'm fortunate to be able to do is I have the Bengals and the Reds participate in the class. Well, that's a little bit of exaggeration. It's not Joey Votto and Andy Dalton. It's, it's the guys who do the analytics for the, for the Bengals and, and the Reds. And as I mentioned, I, I do uh, I team teach the bracketology class. And I'm just curious, Jeremy, I, I think you've got some, uh, so, some visitors as well and any other kind of special yeah. features like that? We, I've actually, you know, being in LA is, is a big benefit there. So we've, we've had a bunch of people come in. Um, uh, ben Alomar came to talk to the class. Uh, we had a great football panel last week actually where uh, Bruce Feldman who writes for CBS and uh, David Anderson who used to play for the Titans and Tim Chow who presented an, uh, an efficiency metric here two years ago. They came in and and talked, and we've had a baseball panel with a couple of beat writers and uh, someone in operations for the Angels. So, and uh, the students love that. You know, it's a chance to actually see. You know, it's one thing for us to talk about, um, you know, mathematical concepts or computational concepts, but uh, to actually talk to someone who is in the industry um, and can tell you, well, you know, do, do, do the do the Angels actually look at any of this stuff? Do they? You know, does, it, does any of this matter? And then you talk to a player. Like, if, if someone told you, you know, no, you need to run your routes this way, would you listen? And, you know, if some, that, they really, they really appreciate that. It gives them uh, an understanding of how important this is. Because the answer is, the, uh, you know, the, the players, for the most part, do listen. And, you know, now, especially, maybe not, you know, a while ago, but now, this, it is important to the team. So it's, it's, it's good for them to see, see that firsthand. And also, they, they can learn a little bit more about career planning and, and you know, if they want to take a, if they want to pursue these things in the future, how exactly to get there. So one, one of the things that we did this year, actually, we had a session towards the end of the semester before the students did their projects, but after they have gone through the technical part of the course, uh, that was going to be the use of analytics in the media and in the game. That was the theme. So the guest speaker for today, actually, was Shira Springer from the Boston Globe, who some of you may have heard, heard yesterday. But Shira came up with this wonderful idea, which was that uh, unbeknownst to the students, we were going to have an expert on the in-game part. How does this work? Well, Shira takes over the class and is, is leading a discussion on some projects that she's published in, in the Globe, which actually had a fair amount of uh, sports analytic content, it had to do with athletes aging over time and how their performance changed with age and so on. But we got to the in-game part, and she looks at me and says, well, I don't know, Ed, I'm not really an athlete, and I'm not really a coach. I don't, I don't know much about in-game decision-making. Have you ever coached a sport and made in-game decisions? And I said, well, uh, no. And she said, well, maybe we should talk to someone who has. At which point, I pushed a button on my laptop, and there on the screen in the front of the class is Rick Carlisle. So now, that's for you folks, that's been an everyday experience for the past two days. But for my crowd at Yale, it was mouth-dropping. Uh, uh, and uh, Rick comes in with his uh, stern face and wry sense of humor, and we're, you know, it's so nice of you to spend some time with us. It's okay, Ed, my game's not until 8 o'clock tonight. Come on, what's the <laughs> question? And so on. Uh, it, it had a huge impact on the students, and what was neat was to basically hear reinforcement from a very respected sports professional that the kind of uh, stuff that we were talking about in class actually mattered to him 
that it mattered to the Dallas Mavericks, that uh, they have you know, made good use of, of, uh, of this sort of material. And so something very reinforcing about that. And of course, the students were also all asking whether or not he could give them a job, but anyway. You know, I don't know, all, your, all the professional teams in Iowa, um, oh wait, I was curious whether you have any, any visitors or uh, anything similar to that. Uh, I've had the, like the, the students I've had, I've had the fortune of having two students that one works for the Bears and one works for the Indiana Pacers now. So having them come in and, and allowing them to share their experience of what, you know, what their process was and then getting their positions very helpful. Also giving them a real, giving students a kind of a real uh, picture of what they have to do, you know, uphill climb they face. Um, but what's the benefit of being in academics is that we also have, you know, it's open source. Uh, I mean, p people are publishing research uh, all the time, on, and so for getting material for the class is quite easy. Um, I, I give ex you know pull examples from uh, different practice-oriented journals that are sports-oriented. Have students watch them. I've actually had students watch video clips from previous uh, MIT conferences, and then I say, "Watch this," and then we're going to talk about this. And I'll well, I'll explain it. You might, they might talk, you know before more of the technical conferences, we'll talk about it more, but. Uh, not allowing the uh, the fact that we have no professional for franchises in Iowa City there does isn't a major uh, inhibitor to the interest of the class. Right, right. Maybe we can you know think a little more broadly about how universities can influence this field in, in some general sense. Niels, maybe you want to have a comment about you know how how at universities, sports analytics can be moved forward and change and so forth um, it, and taking a look at the future to some extent. Okay, uh, I think what the first thing you have to do to stimulate this in universities is to get faculty involved because if faculty are not interested, it's not going to happen. So, and that mainly happens through research. So at least for me, so I did operation management supply chain management originally, then I thought I would do one paper on football or soccer. Uh, I did the second one and then I started working with some uh, teams and or kind of team data and with a TV station doing media, it's got media analytics and so then I, I launched a course. So I think it's the best way to stimulate it is to stimulate the research because it typically starts on, on that. And the other part is the demand side, so here we have, have students ask your university, why don't we have a sport analytics course? And that's going to create some simulation from universities. Well, I, actually, I want to hear Jeremy's thoughts on this too, but um, there is, I would argue, one barrier that relates to uh, what Nils was just saying. Uh, coming from the academy, we're, when it comes to research, universities expect research to be transparent. They expect the databases to be publicly available. They expect to work to be peer-reviewed in, in academic journals. Uh, they, they expect the results to be verifiable. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the world of sports analytics, and much of it has been talked about in various sessions in this conference, but the difference is, a lot of what's going on is not coming from academics, it's coming from sports organizations, it's coming from individual teams, it's coming from companies. They're less interested in having what they've done published so that everybody can come in and take all of their hard work and tinker with it. They want to keep their data proprietary, they want to keep their methods a secret, they want to share some of what they're doing, but they don't want to share everything with what they're doing. So there's a bit of a clash there. Uh, if, if you want to have access to the best data in some of these areas, it might even involve you know, signing some, some agreements that you're not going to make the data available, but you can't do that if you're going to be publishing in a university setting. So there is a little bit of a clash there, and of course this isn't the first place where that's happened. This happens in business, uh, b business uh, research all the time in, in, in different areas. And, of course, it's often been a problem in medical research too, people working for pharmaceutical companies. So, so there is some of that. That would be maybe the biggest barrier that I could think of because I, I really think that on the interest side, both from the student's point of view and from the university's point of view, as long as the research is viewed as actually being serious stuff, good stuff, contributing to knowledge in the broadest of ways, either through the methods or through the specific findings, I think the universities will support this. I, I have a number of students who have come up with pretty, you know, 
even with their sort of modest technical backgrounds, have come up with pretty interesting ideas for projects. And I just tell them we can't get that data. Like it's out there, but we, we just don't have access to it. And I think it's interesting. Um, I don't want to start too much of an issue here, but it's interesting let's, that, let's do that. <laughs> that um, the paper that won best research paper two years ago uh, was done, the affiliation of the authors was the University of Southern California. And the paper that is up for best papers by the same people done this year is done by Second Spectrum. That's their affiliation. So they've taken, they've, you know, the same people, and they still, they still have academic affiliations, but, but the, the, you know, for their day jobs, you want to call it that. But uh, the affiliation, the official affiliation for the paper is now their company, um, which just goes to show that the data has been removed from, from academia. And, and that, you know, so, and so you look at some of the, the other academic papers, they're using data from two years ago because that's the only data they have available. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a real problem. And I don't know if it's going to, you know, on a long enough timeline, that's going to affect the uh, quality and the applicability of the work that, that uh, academics are, you know, both you know, faculty and students alike. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect the quality and the applicability of the, of the work that they produce because they just don't, won't have relevant data available. Mm. Uh, so it's, 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 the last thing I'll say is it's funny yeah. that, that a theme of, of this conference, uh, I would say this year, and I was here last year, but a big theme was there's just so much more data now right. for some people. <laughs> Not, and, and the question is, is, is there just, and you see if you go to talk to any person in, who runs uh, an analytics department for an organization, you talk to any media outlet, they will tell you we can't hire good people. I mean, it's partially because they don't pay very well, but that's, <laughs> but uh, you know, we don't have enough good people. We, 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 we need better people. And it's possible that those better people are in academia, and then we're either training them now or they're existing as faculty who do research, but they don't have the data. So I don't know who wins that struggle or, or, or how we meet in the middle, but it's probably going to have to happen eventually. Right. I, I think uh, both Jeff and, and Niels actually aren't just faculty members, but also have companies. So maybe, I don't know if you want to talk about that, you know, this, uh, this availability of data and, and, and that that dichotomy and w w you know within and outside the university well i know for my llc um, my uh former student has all the work to be honest with you i mean he, you know writ code wrote code to essentially scrape the web um so there might be repositories but we're we're doing some of the legwork to actually get it ourselves for what we need um, my, most of my work is not necessarily in uh, data analysis. It's just getting the, getting the data that we need and then actually applying a decision-making algorithm. So I do a lot of things with uh, drafts. And um, due to the lack of data on real teams, we do a lot of things with fantasy baseball and fantasy football because that's data that you have. Um, and so uh, the idea being that there's a kind of some parallels between the two. Once you, once you give me data on real, real franchises, the same algorithm approaches would work. Uh, so I, that's how we got around it. We, we scrape what we need. Right, right. Yeah, I think we, we, we started more on, on that and uh, scraping things. And, uh, but recently we, we worked, for example, a lot with uh, Prozon and Misco on uh, soccer, where they, they have hundreds of people whose job it is to watch football in slow motion uh, and sit and code every touch on the ball, when it happens, by who, and they have tracking of each player every tenth of a second. Obviously, this is very, also very sensitive data, and it's on, uh, you, you can't just publish this about people even. I think it would be some legal things, but the way we have set this up is that we have a central bank of the full data set, and then we create a small anonymous data set that you can do to develop research, and then you can send your code in we, from the, the collaborators, and then we can run it on the big data set. So I think there are, there are ways to, to do this uh, and to, to get access to do research on, on the data without necessarily distributing it. Another thing is that I think it's, it's nice to see, I, I would say that there are a, a lot of competition between these data or sport analytics companies have been on having the data. I think that the dimension of competition seems to be shifting from having the data to being able to use the data. And data is becoming more of a commodity. So I would be quite hopeful that more and better data gets publicly available in, in the future. And also cheaper to collect, and more yeah. people can collect it. So. You have a comment? 
well, slightly different topic. But okay. Well, yeah, anyway, I, I just wanted to go back uh, 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 to this business about, you know, uh, are we teaching statistics, or are we teaching modeling, or are we teaching how to uh, use, use data for decisions? Um, and, and, you know, there, there, were, there were different responsibilities, I feel, that we have as professors, and one of them is actually to make sure that students don't know just enough to be dangerous. So if you, are, if, if you look at a typical business school curriculum, what the MBA students learn? They learn a lot of basic statistics. They learn, in my view, too much regression. Uh, regression is one of these techniques which is very attractive because it sounds like you can predict something from a whole bunch of other things, and it's very easy. You load stuff into Excel, and you push a button, and you get answers out. One of the things that I try to use the sports class is sort of a secondary objective. Is, is to try to help students understand that there is an awful lot of common sense thinking that should go on before, during, and after one goes through any of these exercises. So you know, just a little thought experiment here. On one of the first days of classes, I do the following. I give them a bunch of data. What are the data for each of the past five Major League Baseball seasons? How many teams, how many games did each team win? And what's the difference between how many runs they scored and how many runs were scored against them? You can probably guess where I'm going with this, but the point is, all right, the idea is to figure out how many wins you get if I know the difference in scoring. What do you want to do? Everyone's hand goes up. I want to run a regression. I want to predict wins from that. I say, well, is there anything you might want to do before that? I mean, and finally, people are sort of, there's silence. And finally says, well, you know, maybe we could make a scatter plot. Maybe we could look and see what the thing looks like. And, so they do that, and lo and behold, you see an almost beautiful straight line between the difference in points and the number of wins. And then they say, okay, now we want to run a regression. It looks perfect. And I said, well, wait a minute. Can you tell me before running a regression what the answer is? Can you tell me what the answer has to be? And there's silence in the room. I say, well, what can you tell me about baseball? How many games are there in a season? Okay, 162. What's the average number of wins? What's the average number of losses? Every time one team wins, the other team, what's the average number of points for? What's the average number of points against? Those averages kind of have to be the same. Suddenly they realize, after thinking about it, that without running the regression, you know that the number of wins is going to be 81 plus something, because 81 is half of the number of games. Right? That puts you there. What's the coefficient going to be on the difference between runs for and runs against? Guess what? It's the ratio of wins to runs. And all of a sudden, You've just fit a regression without pushing the button in Excel, and you learned what it meant. And I said, now go run the regression. And lo and behold, you get the same result. All right, so what's the postscript? Oh, they say, oh, this is great. We can do this for anything. I say, OK, now go try and do it for basketball. It doesn't work. How come? Ah, you've learned something. There's something different about the way scoring corresponds with victories in baseball versus basketball. How come? And, and that now leads to a whole discussion about how these sports are actually different even though on the surface they look sort of the same. And we can do this with really simple techniques that they think they know, but it turns out that they don't really know. It's all the Pythagorean theorem, right? <laughs> you know, it's just what the exponent By is. By the way, it's just what the exponent you, uh, uh, is. You, you did this to me. And if I take that Pythagorean <laughs> theorem from Bill James and I take the Taylor series on it, you know what I get? I get that the number of wins is 81 plus wins per run times the difference in runs. You get, ex in other words, it's all consistent. It's all self-consistent. You, you bring up an interesting point, though, about, about uh, learning just enough to be dangerous. And that's, that's what uh, teams and media organizations, they, they, those are, that's who they hire, is they hire people who either know a lot about statistics or um, math and know enough sports to be dangerous, or they hire people who know a lot about sports but know enough statistics to be dangerous. And so that sort of begs the question, of are we failing, you know, is, is the academy failing this, this uh, you know, this workforce that, you know, should we be teaching more sports, should we be teaching more statistics, you know, can we, can we construct uh, at a university level, can we construct um, the next generation of sports analysts, you know, should they, should they know, in addition to knowing statistics and planning and risk, should they know machine learning, should they know methods of computation, should they know software packages, you know, it's, it's the, if the, you know, the people who are hiring are probably going, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> um, but the question is, is it our job to teach those people and teach those skills? Right. Yeah, that, that, that little bit of knowledge, the, the students who think they know the math in the 64 
team single elimination tournament realize that they say, let's see, well, two to the fifth plus two to the fourth, my God. The 64 teams is one winner. How many games are there? <laughs> How many games are there? 63. 63, right? 63 teams have to lose. You don't have to do any math at all. So it's only the ones who know the math have the problems with that, <laughs> you know, actually. Earlier, you, 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 you mentioned Shira's name, and I know you're doing something that's very exciting right now. And, and I think one of the uh, uh, activities um, we have in terms of being able to, to educate is not simply in the classroom, but also the general public and those who read newspapers, if anyone still reads newspapers and, and the media and so forth. And I, I think you're involved in something. Maybe you want to describe a little bit about where this is going. Well, it hasn't started yet, but, but it's on the drawing board. Should I not have brought it up? It's on the drawing board. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice that you brought it up. So, um, so the idea is really very simple. Um, if, if you take a look at most of what goes for sports reporting, it's, it's human interest stories, it's stories describing the game, the, you know, all, all, the, all the stuff that your typical sports fans would be most attracted to, why people love sports. But we are now starting to see some of these sports analytic ideas seep into the reporting. The issue is, is whether or not they're being sort of handled in the right way and whether or not the typical sports fan knows enough to follow them. And so the idea was, well, a great thing to do would be to start small with very small, short articles that would introduce these types, uh, these ways of thinking. So you have to do it in a way which is going to be exciting to, to sports fans. So, you know, the sure writes for the Boston Globe. So, uh, you know, the Red Sox had a pretty, pretty good year. Uh, they, they, they have uh, uh, Dustin Pedroia gave the Red Sox a home edge and settled for All right, all right, all right. For. So, the, so the question is, you get these different players. Uh, one's getting paid $300 million. The other one's being paid $200 million or $150 million, whatever it is. It, you know, are they worth it? How can, how can you talk about it? Can you talk about it in very simple terms that, that people can understand? And you start introducing some of these concepts. Well, how many wins do these people create? How can we actually measure that? Without going into any of the technical details, you just start exposing the concept. You start drawing a few pictures. I mean, you know where this is happening already? It, for those of you who read the New York Times, I know that's the enemy, but anyway, for those of you who read the New York Times, during the uh, football playoffs, didn't they have uh, uh, Brian Burke's advanced NFL stats fourth down calculator going for every fourth down in every game? Now, nobody who's reading the paper, or almost nobody, understands any of the calculations behind how's that done. But boy, what a whole lot of fun this is to just kind of look at this and, 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 and see these numbers popping up. So, so that's the idea. The idea is to try and pick interesting situations in sports. They could be in-game. They could be player evaluations. They could be more general questions. But address them through the lens of sports analytics in a way that's digestible. Lots of pictures, uh, you know, not so much of a focus on the numbers, but focus on the concepts. Uh, that, that's the hope. And so we want to start doing that later, later on. OK. Um, I, I like to think of us as thought leaders in this field in general. And so maybe we can think a little bit about wh where is this field going? How do you see the field of sports analytics evolving? And then after that, we're going to turn it over to some questions from the audience. Start with you, Jeremy. Yeah, do you mean in terms of academia? Well, no, just the, the whole field of sports analytics. Is it going to, have we reached a point where we, we can't collect any more data? Is it really a technology thing rather than an analytics thing? Is it, you know, is, is the real thing going to be education I and think communication it's a money thing. to the coaches? I think it's a money thing. I mean, if you, um, I think that uh, industry has shown is that when you pay people well, they usually do good work, and uh, you know Google is a good, great example of that. You know, I mean, I, I mean that's not it's not quite that simple. But what I, I'm interested to see is um, we're still not everyone has buy-in for this in terms of actual on court. Is this going to help me win? Winning helps the bottom line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm curious to see if uh, if um, if the work that is produced is subpar because. You know, from especially on like an organizational team level, if the work that is produced is subpar because they can't get the best people, 
So, you, you know, it's, it's possible in five years you could actually see sort of a buyout where teams are like, this just isn't accomplishing anything. Not because the, the methods are unsound or not because the techniques are wrong, but because they can't, they just don't get the right people to do it. Um, which then, of course, begs the question, are we, are we training the right people to do it? So mm -hmm. that's, like, it's a bleak right. future, but right. we'll see. So you see a little leveling off, maybe, of how it's used. Yeah, Jeff. So I guess I could cast kind of like a, a rosy picture first. You know, Jeremy, I think, cast maybe <laughs> the, the worst case scenario. <laughs> that, uh, and I've heard this mentioned on some other panels, is that I, nobody really knows what this is worth yet. And yeah. if, if franchises determine what it's worth and it's worth a sizable amount, then they will actually be able to justify investing more. And then by investing more, then you might actually see instead of a group of one analytics person or three analytics people, um, you might see actually a team where you might have specialists. You'll have like a computer scientist who's like a specialist at the data extraction and you'll have a statistician and so forth. And you, you, know, you also have your domain expertise because uh, right now they're looking for the skeleton key. <laughs> they're looking for the all-in-one because they don't want the, the investment is, you know, I, in my, my impression is that they don't, the investment's not quite there yet. They're not going all in. So uh, in a perfect world, I guess if, it, if the value's there and they, they can justify it, they would see a growth of uh, more analytics teams on franchises. So, uh, uh, or I think in American sports have, have been leading in analytics. Uh, but if you look at the wide variety of sports and also soccer that I've been working mostly with, I would say that the main, the main two mathematical techniques that are used in analytics uh, is one, one is to count and the second one is to take averages. Is there a big potential for, for the future? Yes. <laughs> Good. We, have, we, we have other moments beyond the well, first. I, 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 has its moments. Ed, I, I, I you, so Ed and I were talking about this earlier that, um, that there's right now what you're seeing is a lot of uh, what's sort of you know, new and exciting is a lot of sort of existing statistical techniques applied to sports. And you know, kind of before Bill James, that had never occurred to, it, to anybody. But what you might see. It, I, I, don't, I would say we probably haven't seen yet, but you might see is actual new techniques developed in the context of sports. You might mm -hmm. see new techniques developed, um, you know, new machine learning classifiers, for example, that, that, are, that are developed specifically in the context of sports with those data sets. The question is, is where is that going to happen? Is that going to happen in industry and academia? So that's, that's I guess, a rosier picture. I, I, think, I think we're already seeing that. Yeah. I mean, with, the, with all of the new real-time spatial tracking data, which is going on in basketball and in baseball, right. it's making it possible to develop models which never have been in existence before, really. And no one would have thought that those technologies were going to be used for these kinds of applications. And so, so, uh, so, so that's already happening. I, I would like to point out that, again, there's sort of a difference uh, in the level. If you're talking about someone with PhD knowledge in, in uh, mathematics or, or computer science, uh, statistics, what have you, uh, I, I like to think of uh, you know Wall Street. You have people who went there with degrees in physics to become very important uh, you know, players in, in, in developing all kinds of trading strategies and algorithms and so forth. People who are going to make those kinds of advances are not going to be coming out of an MBA program. People who are going to be helpful in this coming out of an MBA program are people who will get involved at the management level will have to be very intelligent consumers of these sorts of, of results, the same way that they're intelligent consumers of other uh, advanced models uh, that, that, that have to do with all, all, all kinds of organizations. So it can well be that without necessarily understanding all the details that go into computing, say, uh, a, 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 con a contribution measure of a particular individual, they will have to be quite adept at figuring out you know, what should that translate to monetarily? How can you bring this together with all the other revenue opportunities that such a player would bring to your team? And how do you, you know, bring this into a negotiation, that sort of thing. There are also all sorts of other business-related things in sports that don't have to do with the game itself, like ticket sales, merchandising, uh, all of that sort of stuff for which MBA folks are actually pretty well, well positioned to get involved with. So there are just so many different levels at, right. at which one right. can think about. Well, let, let's hear from folks in the audience to see if you have questions. We have a couple of people with, with, with microphones. Um, I'm really interested in what work you all have done in terms of maybe 
bridging certain places even at your own universities or maybe between businesses. I work at a high school where I'm teaching a sports analytics course and so much of the value is That's in awesome, by the way. learning about our sports medicine department, our athletics department, and working with the kids who are both athletes and students in my class and their ability to just see this is what really matters. We need to look at sleep. Let me tell you what happens when we have to travel 12 hours a week. And I guess I'm wondering about what efforts y'all are taking in order to find out where the interesting questions are at your university. Are you bridging with your own athletics departments or with sports medicine in your schools? Yeah, I, I've, um, I, I've had some, some work with our, our baseball coach at the <coughs> university who came in and said, I have a portfolio. I have some scholarships to offer. What's the best way for me to use the scholarships? And, and for the most part, when I hear about these things from, 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 from different folks, I try to get students involved in the, in, in, in the projects. So I want to hear from some others on this, if you've had some experience this way. Other things? It, it, well, there were, <laughs> it's a little bit humorous. There were a couple of, oh, of well, players. Oh, well, we're not on, interested. You don't want that. <laughs> uh, some players on the Yale soccer team who were taking the course, they neglected to tell me that they were playing in a tournament in California, and so they, of course, didn't show up in class, which made me a little bit angry. I get to the, anyway, I said, oh, I'm sorry, you, we're playing in this soccer tournament. I said, oh, okay, well, did you win anything? And the email came back, no, the stupid coach doesn't understand state spaces. <laughs> You know, but I haven't done anything uh, with, with either the sports medicine people. As it turns out, both the Yale soccer coach and the golf coach, of all people, uh, sat in on the class uh, for a while. But, but we, we, haven't, we haven't started any projects. Okay. We only have five minutes. Let's, let's get to a couple of other questions. All right. I'll try to keep this as quick as possible. Um, first of all, to Jeremy, what you were saying about training students and maybe that you have the wrong students being trained. Um, I have to wonder the extent, and I'd love you all to address this, to which it may actually be the wrong training. There's been a lot of talks here that have to do with multiplayer tracking and visual data analysis and things that I don't think you would learn in a business school. Now, my background is in astrophysics. I have the skill set <laughs> to do that. But people don't tend to jump from astrophysics to sports management. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm wondering about is how would you guys address the idea of literally introducing new skill sets, maybe not in business, pulling from STEM students, you'd probably have to pull from computer science or physics or whatever, uh, to get to the next generation. Okay, so first of all, I, I didn't want to imply that I had the wrong students. No, My I, students I, are I, all, I'm uh, paraphrasing <laughs> badly. He, 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 he's a computer scientist. So no, yeah. I know. So, in fact, I figured Jeremy I identified with a lot of what you said. Right, <laughs> so. right. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't teach in the business school. I teach in something called the Information Technology Program, which is, uh, can be thought of as sort of a, an applied wing of computer science. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, there's, there's uh, uh, Niels and I had a conversation about this. There, there's more to sports, analysis, uh, sports analytics than just modeling. There's, there's issues of computation, there's issues of visualization, there's, uh, again, you know, there, there's, there's more to it than just that. So I think you bring up a very good point about, um, so you know, I can't speak to, to their experience, but uh, I do think it's important to make sure that, like you said, that it's, it's more than just considered a, 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 you know, a, a risk or IR type, type audience. It's a good point. You know, so, but I, I, students are not going to be studying skill with us. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we have students who study healthcare management and healthcare operations, but they don't know how to read MRIs. So it's the same <laughs> kind of thing. We're going to do one last question. Yeah, her question actually was a, a nice bridge to where I was going with mine. Um, what do you see as the path or the barriers or the potential future of this becoming an actual academic entity of itself, oh. as opposed to being in the business school or the, you know, computer science field or engineering it, or whatever. It, it, it's, um, a, it, it's, oh, sorry, continue. I didn't no, I mean, I, I was kind of rambling, but I mean, just if, if the lifeblood of an academic person are publications and, and funding, and the funding sources are private teams that don't necessarily want things public, and there's not a agreed upon peerage to review for publications, like, how do you make this 
your main area of research? Is there a way to do that? Well, you're, you're sort of asking two different questions, and I'll answer the first one. Um, so, you know, I actually looked into what it would take to make, like, so I think that the question you're, one of the first questions you're asking is, uh, sort of, does, does sports analytics have a soul? Which is to say, is there something that a sports analyst could do that a regular anal analyst could not do? Um, and, and so, that's an interesting question. And I've looked into what it would take to be, if you had a sports analytics major, for example, and would it make sense to cut out the theoretical parts of computer science and introduce to, and, and, and teach more statistics? Would it make sense to, um, you know, to uh, you know have a class where you learn uh, risk, or you know, have a, excuse me, a, a curriculum where you learn risk planning, uh, you know, uh, computer science, uh, you know, some database programming, machine learning, and like what what would that person look like, and would they be able to do anything else other than just sports analytics? Because that's sort of an important issue because not everyone can work in sports. The, the, the four of us are operations researchers, but I know that we've all published papers, academic papers, in, in sports and stuff that, that relates to that. Uh, I'm not saying that they necessarily are in the top journals and that that's not going to move your career. Uh, but I, I think it's becoming more and more legitimate as a field to be able to publish in that. It would be <laughs> pragmatic about it. For, for a sports analytics major, it'd be interdisciplinary. I mean, you would need, you know, because you're gonna have problems that are gonna require fields that aren't in a college of engineering or computer science or college of business. Um, but I think first and foremost, uh, you need places for those pe students to get gainfully employed. I, I do think that there is at least one funding source coming from international that's actually at MIT that is specific, that was, uh, the grant was given specifically for sports research, sports analytics research. Plus I think here it's, or I, I know there is some disagreement on the panel, but I can say my view on this is uh, or related. I think it's more, more important to have a good knowledge of the tools and then, and some practice in applying them. So I know many people disagree with that, but at least in my experience, I, I've done a lot of research on the fashion industry, and I work a lot with fashion companies. I just couldn't care less about fashion. I get comments that are dressed like shit, but it's just, uh, but I think that's a very fascinating and challenging problem. Same, similar thing with sports. I don't, I'm not an expert on, on sports. I, I get, uh, I, I talk to people and I, kind of, I rely on other resources who are experts on sports. So for me, I, I would say it's like 80% is to have the tools, and then to me it's just applied research in terms of applied statistics, applied operation research, Stanford applied Gundy would disagree. computer science. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm really happy, you know, we have 100 people here at the end of the conference, I think that's great. I, I think one of the ways we're going to do this, I know at South Florida they're going to be instituting a, uh, an online course, and maybe that's the thing, we'll have it online so that everybody can take the course and, and we can go from there. So thank you all very, very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.